Hello ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to Ring Respect Radio right here on the Video Bros Network. My name is Bobby Munson and I'm joined on the phone by my guest. He is my video bro. He is the man with the most angelic voice, the throat of the goat. He is Papa Smokes. Papa Smokes, how you doing this week? Yeah, I'm doing great, Munson. How are all you wrestling people doing out there? Hopefully everybody's enjoying the beautiful weather, but at the same time, going and making sure you're keeping your social distancing up as we continue to fight this COVID-19 thing. Hopefully we're going to get back to some form of normal coming up soon. And you know what, Papa Smokes? I'm looking forward to getting back to some live wrestling action. How about you? Yeah, that's definitely the main thing for me, too, is I want to get back to the matches. I'm tired of watching it on TV. I want to watch in person. It definitely so, and it's going to be an exciting time once we can get back to that. I'm looking forward to that very first Prairie Pro Wrestling show that we get to do once this whole thing is lifted, finally. But, you know, speaking of wrestling, Papa Smokes, we've got all sorts of product that we can still share with the fans at this time. As you know, Prairie Pro Wrestling, we've been sharing our Lethal Lottery Tournament from July of 2019 that took place at Food Truck Wars here in Saskatoon. And you know what, Papa Smokes? The finals just hit YouTube here today, so everybody should head on over to the Prairie Pro Wrestling YouTube channel. Check out the final match. It is a brawl, a no-holds-barred battle between Sheik Akbar Shabazz and Davey O'Doyle to crown the Lethal Lottery Champion for Prairie Pro Wrestling. What a time that was, Papa Smokes. I remember it well just on such a nice night in the middle of the summer during food truck wars with a big giant crowd. Great atmosphere, just a great debut for Prairie Pro Wrestling, and uh, I, I highly recommend everybody go back and watch that match again. It's great stuff. It is. I'm going to definitely be checking it out later tonight. Hopefully everybody else checks it out too. One hell of a brawl, lots of fun, some crazy shit goes down in that one, so I definitely recommend checking that one out. But today on the show, we've got a lot to talk about, some great topics here tonight. We're going to be talking about the use of cinematics in professional wrestling. There's been a lot of talk about this as of late. We know at WrestleMania, we saw the Firefly Funhouse match. We saw the Boneyard match. Two of the most talked about WWE matches in quite some time. And were they actually matches? Would you consider them to be part of the wrestling atmosphere when you break it down. We're going to talk a little bit about that today and some of the other cinematic matches throughout the history of professional wrestling. Then, we're going to go on to talking about the Alberta Invitational Wrestling Tournament that you can check out right now on YouTube. It's brought to us by our friends at WrestleSode, at the uh, uh, Wrestling Radio as well, and also the WCSN Win Column Sports Network. All our good friends in Alberta, we're going to be talking about the matches from the first round of that action. And then we're going to end the show talking about the history of feats of strength in wrestling. We're going to talk about tough guys. We're going to talk about those moments that make strength magical in professional wrestling. So let's get this show started. And we're going to talk about the cinematics in professional wrestling right here, right now. A lot of talk about this. First and foremost, Papa Smokes. How familiar are you with you are you with the matches that took place at this year's WrestleMania that have been the buzz of the wrestling world at the moment? Well, I'm familiar with them. I, I watched uh, the Boneyard match and uh, the Firefly Funhouse match, and uh, I have seen a couple of uh, cinematic style matches in the past. So it's, it's not completely new ground for me. Definitely. So now. I mean, I take a look at this. I know that this has split the internet and the entire wrestling community. 50% of them absolutely hate the idea of cinematics in wrestling. And it looks like this could be something that happens more frequently, especially from the WWE. Uh, you know, a lot of people absolutely loved it. They said this was some of the best storytelling they had seen in, especially WWE for that matter, in such a long time that they were excited. The question remains... Were they just really excited because they got something different during a time when there's absolutely nothing to watch? I, I often question whether or not these matches would have had the same impact had they taken place where WrestleMania was at a live crowd. What are your thoughts on that one, Papa Smokes? Yeah, it seems to me that with uh, the social distancing and COVID shutdown and stuff that... Uh, WWE was kind of over a barrel in terms of uh, throwing that WrestleMania show. We all know that Vince uh, held out for a long time and really, really wanted to go on as usual. And then uh, that, of course, uh, fell through for health regulations and such. But um, 
I, I feel like uh, those two matches were something that they felt they needed to do, and I think it probably was a good idea to um, not have the entire show be empty arena matches. We've talked about empty arena matches on this show in the past, and uh, it really is hard to replicate the feeling of energy that the crowd brings to it. And I, I don't think anyone really realized how much... Uh, the crowd is a, is a part of professional wrestling. is is like a character in professional wrestling. It, its reactions and its uh, its joy and its and its hate and its pain and everything else. And uh, so I think uh, I think WWE was smart to do these kinds of matches at this time. I, I feel like they almost had no choice. It almost seems like every time that their backs are against the wall, they seem to come up with these opportunities to try something different and it ends up being some of the most talked about stuff in professional wrestling and we've seen it many times before when they've experimented like this i mean there seems to be a large portion of fans that are calling for this type of stuff in professional wrestling i know coming from the old school it's a little bit different definitely i mean there definitely probably wasn't a whole lot of cinematics back in the territory days i wouldn't imagine uh maybe you can uh, no. shine a light on that one for us well, yeah, no, I, I think you're right about that. The, there have always been some attempts to uh, jazz up the way wrestling looks on TV with some little effects and stuff like that, but I don't think I had seen a, a full-on storytelling, movie-making type uh, presentation on a wrestling show uh, until I had watched uh, Lucha, Lucha uh, Wrestling. I'm not sure what the show was, AAA Lucha Wrestling from... Uh, Mexico City. They used to come on the Latin Channel late at night. I had some good times watch <clears throat> watching that uh, completely in Spanish, and uh, I can remember uh, there was a face, a, a baby face. I, I can't remember his name. A handsome, popular young wrestler who had been injured. He was in the hospital, so they they took the cameras out to the hospital, interviewed him uh, in his room, but he was being released that day. He comes out onto the street uh, with his crutches and such and talking to the announcer a little bit. And then here comes La Parca, his opponent, with a chair running across what had to be a 12-lane street in Mexico City with so much traffic, running across in the middle of the day and attacking this baby face on the on the street. I, damn, I was laughing about that one. Like, what a, what a good one that was. I think... Uh, uh, it would started like that. It started with the uh, Mexicans. They also have a lot of long angles and long uh, stories being told in, in lucha wrestling. Uh, you know, there's lots of uh, uh, stories to do with uh, the, their various masks and, and their legends and uh, and that kind of thing. So uh, that's when I first remembered is from uh, lucha wrestling in, in Mexico. And essentially that would have been what... Uh... I guess birthed what we came to know as Lucha Underground for the uh, short while that they were around. Uh, Robert Rodriguez had produced a uh, wrestling product that was, you know, all storyline, all cinematic background, story, everything there. And once it all tied together, it come down to the uh, ring and that's where everything was solved in the end. Uh, you know, the, the production style and everything like that, I found very interesting with Lucha Underground. I think it was the the over the top hardcore stuff that essentially lost it a little bit for me when it came to Lucha Underground. But aside from that, when yeah. it came down to the, the the wrestling aspect and the cinematic aspect, I liked what they were going for personally. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, part of their uh, part of the cinematic uh, things they were doing too was was with they they debuted the two four seven title, and uh, so there was always a crew following around the wrestlers when you know seemingly. Uh, not at a wrestling event or venue or anywhere near a ring. And, and uh, you know, as we've seen uh, WWE kind of reprising that in modern day, uh, that I suppose that fall, falls under the uh, umbrella of what we're talking about too. And uh, uh, some some comedy, I, I liked it. I thought it was pretty well done. And uh, But um, it, yeah, I think it depends on the uh, angle they come at it with. Uh, uh, obviously, uh, something like the 247 title is meant for some com comedic relief whereas something like a uh, boneyard match is is a uh, you know a grudge match the culmination of a feud and uh, it's going to be a lot darker 
And you know what? The one thing I did really enjoy about the Boneyard match in particular, which I think a lot of people could agree, is that every time we see The Undertaker come back after all these years, I mean, I absolutely adore the man's career and everything he's ever done. Enjoyed many of the guy's matches, but you try watching him now and it's not quite the same anymore. Uh, it's, it's rough to watch the guy try to slug through a match in a modern ring and everything. But here they were able to, you know, take the time to do it like an action film and stuff like that. And it kind of brought back some of the mystique of The Undertaker and made it a little bit more enjoyable in that sense than if they would have just had AJ Styles and The Undertaker directly in the ring at WrestleMania. Yeah, I think that's a strong point. Um, that that was part of it for me, too, is that the last couple of matches The Undertaker has done just in the, in the traditional uh, presentation, he hasn't looked very good. It, I I respect the hell out of the Undertaker, but uh, time marches on, right? And and his body's pretty busted up. He's been a he's been a warrior of wrestling uh, his whole life. So uh, if he's not as light on his feet as he used to be, that's fine. But yeah, that's why I agree with your point here too. Is that uh, with the 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 way they filmed this and the way they did the shots and such, uh, you didn't have to see the. the full body view of him uh, wrestling in the ring like like uh, like the traditional presentation they they could make it look a little bit better i thought it was a good decision uh, for that reason too now i'm gonna flip it back to the other match that took place at wrestlemania obviously the firefly fun match funhouse match because a lot of people are torn some people love one not the other stuff like that I'm a little bit more impartial. I mean, I'm I'm going to sit here and admit to you right now, Papa Smokes. I mean, I'm not going to rank these as wrestling matches. If I'm putting them up uh, against other matches for match of the year, that's I'm not doing that. These were not wrestling matches. But the context around the wrestling and the storytelling, I really enjoyed it. I thought the cinematics were great. And I thought the storytelling in the Firefly Funhouse match actually worked for me. I thought it was different, intriguing. I enjoyed it myself. What were your thoughts on that one? Yeah, I was. Uh, I didn't like the Firefly Funhouse match nearly as much as uh, the Boneyard match. Uh, I, I think I have figured out what the WWE was getting at with this story. They're telling, obviously, uh, the life story of uh, John Cena or the career story of John Cena, and uh, uh, I watched some of Cena's old stuff. But I've seen some of Cena's new stuff too, but. Um, this one lost me a bit. Uh, the fact that there was like basically no wrestling or basically nothing done in the ring kind of lost it for me a bit. Um, I get what they're going for. Uh, I have liked a couple of uh, similar matches uh, from Jeff Hardy's canon, some of the various deletion matches. I thought they were well done, and I think that's what they were going for with something good like a final deletion match or a, one of Hardy's other ones. I just... It kind of fell flat for me, uh, I, I, but it could be that I just don't get it. Maybe I don't watch enough current WWE product, but this one this one, kind of got under my skin a little bit because part of the reason for that is that I know that a lot of other companies are going to try doing this stuff now who don't have nearly the, the writing capabilities and the uh, production value capabilities that uh, WWE has and there's going to be some stinkers coming up I think and uh, I just don't like that it uh, sets a trend of doing stuff like this and uh, that that uh, all the other feds uh, are always going to jump on what uh, what the E does and uh, I think we're going to see some god awful limitations of that in the next while well not only that uh, but you also got to imagine they don't have the depth of the story to tell as well, too. I mean, a lot of people discredit WWE and their storytelling and stuff, but the depth is there if it's done right. And when given the opportunity, like in this match, for example, I felt it was done right. I mean, the idea Cena gets sucked into his own kind of like personal hell, bit of a nightmare and stuff of his own career, and it was taking a stab a little bit at the fans as well, too, and how much we feel we know about the business, how we always felt that you know, Cena was, you know, the the Vince's go-to boy. He did what Vince told him all his career. And when he had that opportunity to take his heel turn, that's when you saw the, the reference to the NWO Hulk Hogan kind of era. He didn't take the same route that, that Hogan did that, you know, changed Hogan's career in a totally different way in the late 90s. And the idea was that he got sucked into his own personal hell and that essentially 
erased by the fiend in the end and you're right the references to matt hardy and the deletion series are spot on and i think that that a lot of that you can account to the fact that bray wyatt spent a lot of time on the road with matt hardy while he was still with the wwe and probably learned a lot in essence from matt hardy about character acting in professional wrestling because when it comes down to it i mean we've talked about the undertaker in great length great character actor great wrestler always made the cinematics look remarkable i feel matt hardy ranks in there as well too maybe not as the top of wrestler as say the undertaker but in terms of cinematics and character acting I, matt hardy is right up there for me yeah yeah i i'm with you on that one too uh i've enjoyed a bunch of matt hardy's work and you know i watched him in the in the, the earlier part of this decade and just saw what's What's he doing? Like, he, 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 how is he going to survive in the current uh, wrestling at, uh, uh, climate? And uh, when he came back, uh, reinvented, you know, in, in TNA as uh, Broken Matt Hardy, it was just, uh, it was just such a breath of fresh air. I was so happy for him. I, I was very pleased to be wrong that I, I thought he was going to be gone from the scene pretty soon. And uh, just a reinvention like that, it takes some creativity. It takes some balls to to think of a strange character like that and just go for it and hope that it works out there and hope that the people take to it and it just worked like a charm and uh yeah he's got it down for uh, uh cinematic matches like that and hardy's going to be uh, thought of as the the godfather of cinematic wrestling probably oh for sure and you know once those wrestlemania matches happened this year a lot of people were quick to make the references saying that you know oh they're t- you're borrowing from matt hardy and it's like Yes, in a sense, there's a lot learned from what Matt Hardy's produced in recent years, but the cinematics do go a long ways back. It's just developed a little differently over time. I mean, WWE's been playing with, toying with this for years. I mean, even as far back as, say, I believe it was WrestleMania 10 and the Hollywood backlot brawl between Roddy Piper and Goldust, which partially took place in the ring, but a lot of that was actually filmed with a lot of really ridiculous things going on all around the, the city that day. For sure. And another thing I think about uh, uh, talking about Matt Hardy's uh, deletion matches is that uh, it, it gives them, it gives the writers in WWE a, a, a kind of a signpost almost to, to use in terms of uh, storytelling, in terms of long uh, angles going on. Um, we, we have to remember that, uh, that WWE's TV shows are in fact just that. It's not not like going to a wrestling card and uh, watching five or six matches and listening to a couple of people cut promos. It's it's a TV show, so there's always um, different stuff than wrestling. It's gone that way over the past years. There's less and less actual wrestling on those shows and more and more drama and uh, skits and cut scenes and all the rest of it. So, uh, in fact, uh, uh, at WrestleMania, to have a match like this and tell a story like in the uh, Firefly Funhouse match, you can use it as a tool in storytelling as well because that could be, uh, you know, if they're going to change Cena's uh, outlook or gimmick, so to speak, uh, uh, at this time, then that match is the signpost for that, that that's when it happened, you know, that they can they can act as though this skit is, is for real and that what happened in it is symbolic of what's happening in, seen as actual career so I, I imagine there's that aspect of it too like just as the deletion match uh, changed bray wyatt from uh, his previous character into the fiend uh you know they can use that to, in their storytelling uh, matches like this will work just perfectly exactly and now before we transitioned into our next topic of the night i have to ask the question is there any place for these types of cinematics to be used in you know smaller companies like you know take ones that are doing productions like ourselves prairie pro wrestling not that i'm looking for an opportunity to do any cinematics for prairie pro wrestling anytime soon or at all for that matter (laughs) but what i'm getting at is there are a lot of companies that are producing their own content and stuff do you feel like they have any place to go down this path with the cinematics or is this best left to companies that have the money have the budget have the story depth to be able to tell these kind of stories well, I feel torn about that question. Uh, uh, I, I think it 
matters not what we think. I think they're going to do it anyway, but I think always the the clever and creative people will make the good stuff. And I think that there will be um, people in uh, in uh, smaller companies that are clever and creative and interesting and work with storytelling that will make effective ones. Uh, so I, I think I, I all power to them. And, and if, if wrestling is going to evolve in that way, then people are going to do that. And people are going to try it. And, uh, I, yeah, I tip my hat to those. But um, it, it's probably not easy, right? I, I don't have any experience doing this, but if you've ever watched uh, – a WWE movie when they had their movie studio, you know that they're not terribly good at making movies either, right? Have you ever tried to watch the the Marine or uh, See No Evil? Like, so they have the budget, but yeah, try and watch one of those movies and call it a good movie. So it'll be a work in progress for sure. And uh, I mean, small companies are going to try it with various amounts of uh, success, I think. Well, maybe, who knows, maybe we'll eventually have a Video Bros production that we'll have to break out one of these days anyway and see how it goes. Who knows, maybe we'll have think, to find, I, think, I was thinking maybe we'll find some way that we can write in some sort of storyline angle and a video cinematic production that's going to send us straight to Alberta, Papa Smokes, because that is the destination for you and I down the road sometime. Because you know what, I think we got a score to settle with the boys out in Alberta one of these days. Oh my. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I was listening to the preview for the Alberta Invitational Open thing here. And, you know, I honestly, all this time, I thought I was such good friends with Mike. Mike the ref. And here he was. A, he makes the comment that he was glad that somebody else got to do the video editing for one time. For one time. I think maybe Mr. Mike's have forgotten a little bit about good old Bobby Munson here in Saskatchewan. I don't know about you, Papa Smokes. I think maybe one of these days we're going to have to go visit our buddy Mike the Ref and uh, let him have a little reminder about what Saskatchewan is all about. Oh, you do what you you do, Munson, but uh, I'll go there and watch uh, one of their wrestling cards anytime. Definitely. Well, you know what? Still love you, Mike the Ref, either way. Just having a little bit of fun here today. <laughs> and you know what? That brings us right into today's topic. The Alberta Invitational Wrestling Tournament that is on YouTube. You should definitely go and check it out, and we're going to do a little review of it right now. I want to first give a shout-out to the commentary team that was there. Uh, first, Anthony from Wrestle Sode. Anthony, great job there. And Paul from Wrestling Rodeo. You know what, guys? Commentary is not easy whatsoever. I listened to what you guys were doing and running. You know what? You didn't have a lot of dead air or anything like that. You were having a lot of fun. Great job, guys. Excellent. I, I, I commend you. It's, a, it's not an easy thing to do. And well done to both of you. Congratulations on the great work. So let's... Uh, yeah, I agree. I agree. I'd like to tip my hat to the commentary, too. Good job, guys. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, perfect. Um, so, but let's talk about uh, the in-ring action, Papa Smokes. We had some great matches in the first round. We know that the uh, the rest of them are available on YouTube as well, and we will get to reviewing those on a future episode of the show. But we're just going to go through the first round matches here tonight. So, first of all, that opening video package uh, with Gabriel Omen Lestat was actually a, quite well edited. I thought that was quite the uh, opening little piece of uh, piece of work there that we got at the start. Yeah, I thought so too. Uh, a little bit of cinematic action there, perhaps. But uh, the Omen Gabriel Lestat gives me the creeps at the best of times. So uh, I really like this opening. And uh, yeah, thumbs up to that too. Yeah, and if, uh, if everybody hasn't checked out Gabriel Omen Lestat, you can check out a few of his matches from Food Truck Wars this past summer that we had him on. Uh, on our YouTube channel over at Prairie Pro Wrestling. Or you can definitely check him out. He's been doing a lot of live interviews with... Uh, wrestlers on instagram and social media and stuff like that so definitely go check his show out he's a very very interesting person to listen to and he's got some amazing guests on his show each and every time and speaking of amazing wrestlers in canadian professional wrestling let's start with the first match of the night one of our personal favorites somebody we know very very well sheik akbar shabazz in the opening round against giant orion and i'm going to be first to admit Giant Orion, I apologize, not really familiar with your work. I think Papa Smokes knows a little bit more about you than I do, but I got the opportunity to witness him in this here match. Uh, what did you think of this one, Papa Smokes? Yeah, I loved the match. Uh, you were asking about uh, Giant Orion. I, 
I believe I've seen him at a, uh, uh, another Feds show, a CWE show that came through town a couple of years ago. I think he was fairly new to the wrestling game at that time, but obviously so huge and uh, physically gifted that he made an impact then. And then I enjoyed watching his match against uh, Akbar Shabazz uh, in this first round with a couple of huge powerhouses. Definitely so. And yes, uh, what a great match. In fact, uh, you know, watching two big boys move around like that. And damn it, does Sheik move around a wrestling ring like nobody's business for the physical size of that man? Oh, Munson, and we're going to be talking about feats of strength in a little bit, but uh, there was definitely one in that match. Did you see the, the Sheik put the giant Orion up on his shoulder and right up for his uh, finishing, uh, we call it the crucifix powerbomb, whatever that move is called, uh, Oh, intense strength from uh, Shabazz. I was more than impressed with that. All I can say is if Sheik would have landed that move and Orion would not have managed to kick himself out of that one, we would have seen a different outcome in this matchup. Absolutely. We've seen uh, the Sheik hit that move on Cannonball Kelly, a rather uh, large and heavy competitor from Saskatchewan here, but... Man, when he got the giant up at the end of that at the end of that match, I, I popped for real by myself in my living room here. I, I was just going insane, and, and we've called many of Sheik's matches before, and I've asked the rhetorical question, "How strong is this guy?" And yeah, once again, another example. We don't even know how strong this guy is yet. He's, he's something to be reckoned with. Exactly, and and uh, he came up a little bit short. Giant O'Ryan picking up the win. I mean, good for Giant O'Ryan. Uh, I'd like to see more from this this kid. I'd you know definitely like to see maybe him make his way out to Saskatchewan one of these days too. Yeah, I could see that happening. Definitely so. So yes, John O'Ryan makes it to the next round of the Alberta Invitational Open. Uh, next match up on this card was Cato versus Jack Pride, the man of two minds. Uh, very familiar with Jack Pride. Worked with him a little bit here at Pro, Pro Wrestling. In fact, a few times that he's come out here to work. A uh, wonderful person to work with, uh, I guess, depending on which side of him that you get, anyway. And taking on Cato, um, how familiar are you with Cato Pop Smokes? i got to ask that question. Uh, not very. This this was the first match I watched, but uh, once again, impressed. Uh, the guy's got a lot of moves in the ring there and a lot of speed. Uh, I, I like his approach, and uh, I like the way he uh, interacted with, uh, with the various Jack Prides in that match. This was also a good one. It definitely was. I, I really enjoyed it. I thought this was a very excellent competitive match. I mean, I know that there was a lot of hype going around the original Marky and MRB match, which we'll get to right away. But man, I think Cato and Jack Pride really brought it there and uh, showed a lot of great skill inside that ring. I think so too. Uh, looking forward to more from both. Maybe Cato's another guy we could get to come out and visit Saskatoon one of these times. For sure. There's a just a sea of talent out here in Western Canada. And, you know, I get introduced to new people all the time. And, man, it just, you know what, it, it's gotten to the point now where I almost don't even care about tuning into the big guys as much as I want to just tune into the independents. We got so much more cool shit going on than what they have in the big leagues, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah, well, like we were saying right off the bat, I was saying that I miss watching... Uh, live wrestling well watching this uh, alberta invitational was kind of like being at the matches a little bit i liked the uh, the one camera i liked the just how starkly that it showed the matches a very nice facility they had their small crowd and everything at this time of uh, social isolation and such and uh, it, it did it for me i really liked this show yeah it was excellent uh jack pride coming up with the victory in that one meaning that Jack Pride, the man of two minds, asked to take on the big boy, Giant O'Ryan, in the second round. That is going to be quite the interesting clash. How do you think Jack Pride's going to handle a guy the physical size of Giant O'Ryan? Well, like you said before, it depends which side of Jack Pride shows up. He's got a, he's got a nicer side and a more mean side. And I think he better bring his mean side if he's got the Giant in round two. Definitely so. Uh, so next up, another couple of uh, great talents in the ring. Uh, we had Heavy Metal taking on Dylan Stone. Uh, another great matchup from these two competitors. Uh, I know a little bit about them. I've uh, talked a few times with Dylan Stone, actually, in Heavy Metal. I've seen a little bit of his work. Uh, it was great to see these two clash. I actually feel like this might have been one of the matches that, I, I mean, man, it just about stole the show. I thought this was a great clash between these two individuals. 
Yeah, I think so too. Uh, I've been hearing a lot uh, from Alberta about Dylan Stone. I've been interested to check out his stuff and I can see why they speak so highly of him. This guy looks uh, like a young, excellent, natural talent and uh, he showcased his skills nicely in this match. Um, I also have seen some of heavy metal stuff in the past as he's toured throughout uh, Western Canada. I like this guy a bunch. Um, he's He's a very methodical wrestler. He's got all his uh, all his palms lined up in the right way. Uh, and as I understand it, he's just opened a training facility. And, and is that where these matches were taped, Munson? Is that correct? It very much could be. Uh, this was, uh, I believe, yeah, because I think they mentioned there that uh, you could be trained by uh, both Michael Richard Blaze and the original Marky, I remember the commentators mentioned. Uh, I don't think I, I, maybe I missed it. They didn't mention anything about heavy metal himself, but this very well could have been the facility that's been opened and a lot of the great talents in Alberta are training uh, new and upcoming talents at this particular facility. Yeah, yeah, I think that's correct about that. I wanted to give a shout out to heavy metal and uh, MRB and Marky for uh, uh, giving back to the business, giving back to uh, the youth of professional wrestling and uh you know, without Lance Storm School anymore, we need a we need some strong training facilities. Uh, not unlike our own local uh, Prairie Pro Wrestling Academy, and uh, the new one with uh, Heavy Metal and the boys. Uh, great work, guys! Keep out, keep churning out that awesome Western Canadian talent. We got some in the WWE right now, and we'll get more in the future too. Definitely so. And like Papa Smokes just said, if you're in Saskatchewan and you're looking to get trained, Prairie Pro Wrestling Academy, check us out on social media. And you too can live your dream of being a professional wrestler and joining the best crew in Western Canadian professional wrestling right here with myself and Papa Smokes. Anyway, Papa Smokes, that brings us to the final match of the Alberta Invitational Open. This one between two very well-known names in Canadian professional wrestling. This is the original Marky versus Michael Richard Blaze. And man, the the commentators really built this up. They said that there was a previous encounter between these two in 2019, I believe, that was considered by many to be the best match of Alberta wrestling of 2019. So I was definitely pumped to see what these guys would produce in this matchup. And man, they did not disappoint. Yeah, yeah. And I know the match they're referring to also. There was a clip from that that went viral on, on the internet and... Uh got their names out there, and uh, yeah, I'm with you with this one. The, the, I, I always love some MRB. I, I think the guy's a tremendous talent. I think he's a natural. I think he started so young that, that his, his, all of his uh, natural reactions are wrestling and, and entertainment. I think he's just a fantastic talent, and uh, to see him in the ring with uh, with the original Marky, a guy that's been on the scene in, in the Alberta area for a long time, uh, these two can just uh, do a great match together. And uh, they, they pulled out all the stops on this during the uh, Alberta Invitational match as well. And uh, I was highly entertained. Uh, I'd love to see more. Definitely so. And you know what? Yeah, uh, both these two great competitors, uh, Michael Richard Blaze, definitely a Worked plenty of times with him, called many of his matches as well, too. And you said just an absolute great all-around professional, not only in the ring, but outside of it as well, too. Uh, you know, not had the chance to personally call any matches the original Marky, but man, I really enjoyed watching his work in this matchup. And, you know, it's almost a shame haven't been able to call any of his matches just yet. I would have uh, really enjoyed to be been a part of calling at least one of his matches. Oh yeah, we'd have to uh, we'd have to have our bootstraps pulled up for that. The guy's got uh, many many moves, many very fast transitions, all kinds of holds, all kinds of reversals. He's a he's a obviously a journeyman uh, of wrestling. He's obviously been around uh, the scene for so long, learning, uh, perfecting his craft, polishing it up. Uh, he just looks awesome, and he's obviously a veteran that. Uh, a lot of wrestlers could learn a lot of stuff from out, in, out here in Western Canada. So good to have him uh, teaching uh, in that capacity as well. For sure. And one thing I did have to mention and, and say too is that Michael Richard Blaze, one of the great things about him is not just his in-ring skill, but the ability to know where the cameras are. Michael Richard Blaze is very, very good at knowing where to face how to make sure that he plays himself up to the camera because he wants to make sure the people at home 
see him, know him. They get his facials. They get to be invested in Michael Richard Blaze. And that's the great thing about him. And a lot of people could learn from going back and watching these tapes of Michael Richard Blaze. Just watch how he positions himself to the cameras. He knows where those cameras are and he utilizes them because he knows that more people are likely to see him on the camera version of that than what are at the actual live show. Yeah, and, and we know all about that, don't we, Munson? Uh, as your uh, co-video bro down at PPW Wrestling, uh, it, it's a pleasure for me to, to uh, video his matches because exactly for those reasons, he, he plays to the camera, he's aware of it, and really, it's a win-win situation because, as you said, he gets his face and his name out there looking good to the to the people and the fans and the potential fans that are going to watch. But it's a win side for uh, for the Federation presenting it, too, because it makes good TV. It looks better. It looks like a better production, and it uh, it just helps the quality of, uh, of the TV show that you're putting on, too. So... Uh, Always cheers to uh, MRB for uh, for being awesome all the time. For sure, and that yeah, that goes to anybody. If you're ever at a PPW show, uh, look for me and my COVID EO bro at COVID EO bro. Anyway, down at ringside, and make sure you <laughs> play to the cameras, guys. We're there for that reason. We want you to look into the cameras. Hey, you know what? If you have to push us around a little, push us around a little. Where we could take it, we got thick skin. So anyway, that was the Alberta Invitational Open. MRB picked up the win there, and now MRB will take on Dylan Stone in what should be one hell of a match in the next round up too there, Pops, folks. Oh, good Lord. Yeah, I can only imagine. Uh, I'm going to be watching uh, with bated breath for this uh, for these next finals because I watched the first round and uh, I'm invested in it. Uh, i got to see what happens, and I'm always entertained by some good local wrestling going to be a lot of fun so definitely go check them out i'm going to put a link down to the first round matches in the description below so you can go check that out and make sure to give them a like and subscribe and while you're at it if you haven't done so already what the hell are you thinking like and subscribe our channel too so we're going to go over to our last topic of the day pop of smokes this is where we take a little bit of the rewind down the old retro and lead into a little bit of the modern as well too we're going to be talking about feats of strength in professional wrestling Papa Smokes, why don't you lead the way on this topic? Yeah, for sure, Munson. Uh, I've been thinking about uh, feats of strength in wrestling since uh, uh, one of our previous episodes when we talked about Pampero Furpo and his uh, few of his feats, including uh, bending the steel bar uh, in his mouth. And I, I thought that might be a good topic for us to talk about on this show. Um, I was, I found it. During my researches, I found things to be basically uh, divided into uh, the older style, the, the more uh, carnival style feats of strength, such as uh, uh, breaking boards and uh, and bending bars and stuff like that. And then it seems more like in the modern era of wrestling that they uh, have been doing them in the ring, have been uh, parts of matches with you know using uh, opponents' body weight and such like that. So um, I started out watching some uh, some of this I've seen before, but uh, I was watching uh, one of the great strongmen of the past, uh, Ken Patera. Nice. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, used to be a favorite of mine from the old AWA days, but uh, I watched some uh, Mid-Atlantic Championship Wrestling from the late 70s, and uh, he, he has a little uh, spot where he comes out and challenges Tony Atlas, to a little competition with some feats of strength and uh, pretty entertaining. He uh, he puts a board uh, over a pail and then uh, drives a pretty big steel spike through the board, just holding it with his hand. That was pretty cool. Uh, Atlas was able to do that too. Then uh, Patera brought out the uh, hot water bottles, the old rubber hot water bottles, and blowing it up like a balloon with uh, lung strength to show the cardiovascular and lung strength blowing it up huge until it pops wow. and uh, i've always liked that one too um both were able to do that they uh tore some phone books in half that's a good old school uh feat of strength as it, people nowadays don't even know what phone books are but uh <laughs> ken patera ken, ken patera ripping them on ripping them in half on uh mid-atlantic wrestling 
that was good. And then bending some uh, steel construction spikes just with your two hands, you know, bending it in half into a U shape. That can't be easy either. You need the hand strength and the wrist strength for that. And you know, obviously, Patera, if you know anything about him, was a power lifter uh, of, of some note, uh, having uh, won medals in Pan American Games and Olympic Games, and uh, had a few world records for uh, in power lifting. So he's back in the day was was the strongest guy in wrestling, and uh, and uh, yeah, I always found it entertaining when they would do those. Uh, little exhibitions, uh, as they call it, carnival style. Come watch the strongest man uh, do some feats. And uh, and as we've noticed, they still do that sometimes to this day. They definitely have. They've uh, done a few modern things and stuff. I mean, even in the, the 90s, I mean, especially when WWF at the time, WWE now, brought in uh, Mark Henry, who was at the time considered the world's strongest man. And I remember watching WWF superstars back in the day, and they would have Mark Henry come out a lot of the time not to wrestle, but to show off his feats of strength. And it was back to the old bending steel bars and stuff like that that you were talking about from guys like Pampiro Furpo at the time. Yeah, yeah, and there's there's that famous uh, clip. It might be from a Raw or something, but he uh, he pulls two semi trucks, like just the trucks, uh, with uh, chains around his body or whatever, and he's just just pulling them, they're obviously in neutral or whatever, and he's just pulling them. And it's not one, it's two of them. Yeah. Like, good God, man. Yeah, he was really, a, really good stuff. He was a ridiculously strong individual, and also he was the one who introduced the WWE to Braun Strowman, who, before coming to professional wrestling, was a strongman competitor and champion himself as well, too. Uh, when he came in, I mean... They presented him as this monster at first, uh, ripping down things, tipping over semi-trucks and everything like that. So they were really playing up that feat of strength there with Braun Strowman at the start of his run with the WWE as well, too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the the WWE and F have, have always done lots of uh, strongman-style stuff because I think that Vince Jr., that, that's right up his alley. He likes that kind of stuff. He likes the big, huge wrestlers he likes the extremely strong wrestlers he's he's impressed by those show those showings of raw power so he has always featured uh, some interesting uh, feats and stunts like that on his programs uh, i remember the big show knocking over a big hummer jeep like from its four wheels onto its side that can't be easy but uh, big show obviously with a whole ton of strength uh, and, and McMahon used to always have uh, have his big guys have re uh, arm wrestling matches, too. How many times have we seen uh, Jesse Ventura versus Hulk Hogan in the arm wrestling match or uh, Paul Orndorff versus Hulk Hogan? And, you know, usually some sort of uh, interference will end it or uh, something like that. But uh, like, McMahon's always had a thing for the big, giant, muscular guys and the, the big feats of strength. But it also can create big moments. I mean, especially like you look back in the history of it, like WrestleMania three, Hulk Hogan power slamming Andre the Giant, something nobody ever expected to have happen. And ever since then, that has been a big deal is the guy who ends up being able to pick up the big dude and give him that power move that nobody else can do it. It really pays itself off in those big moments. Yeah, absolutely. And there's been a whole bunch of those, including uh, Lex Luger giving that, body slam to Yokozuna on the uh, on the aircraft carrier and uh, <clears throat> all kinds of uh, good moments like that and to be honest I kind of like uh, I think I prefer the feats of strength that occur in the ring with with other competitors body weights you know uh, uh, one more recent one that I've been enjoying was uh, some of the work of Cesaro and uh, oh, how he does isn't he great he is yeah, he doesn't look like a giant bulky guy or anything like that, but he's got to have the core and tendon strength and muscular strength. And there's an Andre the Giant uh, Invitational Battle Royal. He, he picks up the big show in a full body slam position, full turned body slam, and just puts him right over the top rope. Like, wow, just unbelievably impressive. Like, or then some when... great feats. Or then the time that he grabbed the great Kali by the legs and gave him the, the swings around the, 
by the uh, legs. Yeah. I mean, that's something else. That is one big dude to be lifting up with like that. Oh, for sure. And he gives him the body slam and stuff, too. These are guys that are 400-some pounds. Like, that's that's a lot of weight. And, a, and a, sometimes some awkward lifts, too, with the person. It's not like a barbell that's that's even and, and balanced. It's a person's body weight. It's it's not easy when they're in motion and all that stuff, too. And highly impressed with uh, Cesaro's feats of strength in more modern wrestling, too. And uh, there's been a lot of them over the years, too. Uh, how about the British Bulldog? He's got quite a few as well, huh? Oh, for sure, especially when he'd put guys up for the suplex, holding them up in the air there and stuff. And, I mean, you'd imagine back then, too, a lot of those boys were, you like you say, 300-plus pounds and stuff like that. And when you're trying to hold them straight up, I mean, as much as a lot of fans know about the cooperation of wrestling, you still got to be able to balance a dude up in the air like that for that period of time. Whether they're playing along in any way, shape, or form, you're still using a lot of power in order to keep them up there like that. No, absolutely, and uh, and uh, also with uh, Bill Goldberg uh, doing his uh, suplex type move on on the Big Show and uh, other huge, huge men like that, uh, and uh, Vader as well. Like that's that's extremely impressive uh, in terms of feats of strength. Uh, I know that uh, Vince would be uh, gleefully uh, grinning in the back watching the spots like that. I mean. Yeah, and, you know, we, we'd be, you know, doing an injustice if we didn't also mention the times that, you know, John Cena himself, we mentioned earlier in the show, had a few of those moments as well, too. Like, when he would use his, what the, they call the attitude adjustment uh, finisher there, and he's used it on the Big Show, but better yet, when the time, I believe it was a triple threat with Big Show and Edge, if I'm not mistaken, or may, could be wrong on yeah. the competitors, where he yeah. lifted both those guys up at the exact same time. I mean, that took some... Damn strength there. <laughs> oh, and Cena is one of those examples of he looks so tremendously strong, but he's actually way stronger than he looks, which is just mind-boggling too. But we've all seen him do intense feats of strength. That was one of them for sure. A big show, and then Edge, who's a decent-sized guy, two hundred and fifty pounds or more. That you did. He, Cena had done it to the big show a few times before and just thought, yeah, I'm up in my game. I need another guy on there. That's sort of highly impressive. Definitely so. I mean, there's been lots throughout history. I mean, it used to be, a, I, I found very common in the 90s too, like uh, probably even in the 80s a little bit, I'm sure even further back. But the actual test of strength that guys would do to really kind of warm a match up where you're getting in the center of the ring, you're grappling with each other's hands there and trying to show off who is the tougher guy of the two i mean in a sense was a feat of strength too because you're trying to break an opponent down right in the middle of the ring yeah yeah and that's um the guys play that in the back sometimes too. the wrestlers uh, i've seen a few times uh it's sometimes called uh mercy that game where you uh lock fingers like that and just go for it and uh, the first guy to give up loses obviously but uh and that it's uh, it's crazy that some guys are so tremendously strong. And uh, I read something about uh, Brock Lesnar. Always thought he was the best at that in the back of the WWE uh, locker rooms and such like that. When the guys would uh, arm wrestle and, and play that mercy, but uh, uh, the one guy he could never beat was Kane. <laughs> Obviously a giant dude, but uh, uh, also just off the charts with his uh, physical strength. The guy's been chucking around giant barbells his whole life. Plus he's six foot 10 or whatever. And, uh, just an absolutely massive dude and, uh, just built so strong. It's insane. Oh, definitely for sure. So we were also mentioning earlier on the show, you brought up, uh, an individual that we've both uh, been fans of and, uh, you know, get along with great, uh, Sheik Akbar Shabazz has had his moments with feats of strength, and you were going to mention uh, one from previous moments that we've uh, had here. Yeah, for sure. Uh, like, yeah, like we said, uh, um, it might have been a year or two ago when he was fighting uh, Cannonball Kelly, who's who's 300 plus pounds, uh, 320, 330, somewhere in that range. And uh, Sheik uh, Shabazz has one of those finishers that, takes a lot of strength. you got to lift the whole guy up upside down on your shoulder into that backbreaker position. And uh, he did it with with 
Cannonball Kelly, no problem. And then, God, we watched the Alberta Invitational first round match, and uh, good God, he's got the giant Orion up there who's, who's got to be close to seven feet tall and, and, and probably closer to 400 pounds. And Sheik still got him up. There's, there's no limit to that guy's strength. No, and I mean. Also he, wanted to. Oh, oh, go ahead, Munson. Sorry, I was going to say, and he just keeps getting stronger as the years go on with Sheik Akbar Shabazz. I mean, I think we haven't even you know, hit the tip of the iceberg with how strong this guy actually could get. Yeah, yeah, he's a big guy to begin with, and then he's he's lifting weights all the time. He's training his core, he's training his muscles, tendons, everything, and he, he's got the spirit to try stuff like that. I think part of it is uh, part of being a strong guy in the ring is, is to is to want to try new challenges, to want to try something you're not sure if you think you can do or not, and uh, finding that maybe you can do it, and that that speaks to the mental toughness that uh, Sheik Akbar Shabazz obviously has. The guy's just an excellent talent all around. Definitely so, and uh, hopefully everybody uh, takes the opportunity to get to watch some of his material. Like we said, you know, it's all over YouTube. You can find lots of these feats of strength from Sheik Akbar Shabazz and many of the Canadian professional wrestling talents. And, you know, as always, I, I really highly recommend anybody who's listening to the show in particular to go check out any of the individuals that we talk about or the matches, the, you know, the classics and stuff like that. You know, go learn your wrestling history. I mean, that's what we're trying to do here. We're trying to open your minds to, you know, a whole different level of professional wrestling. I mean, give all of it a chance. Get to know your history. Get to know your modern stuff. And it'll really, really open yourself up to a whole different world of love for this professional wrestling sport that we all really do enjoy. Yeah, yeah, that's been one of the greatest things uh, about these past uh, six weeks since I've had a little more time on my hands of social distancing at home is finally some time to get through and watch all the uh, all the background stuff I've had to watch, and that includes uh, some some more recent wrestling than I usually watch, but. Uh, uh, I'm uh, doing the podcast now. I've got to keep in the loop of what's going on for modern stuff. So having the time to do so just means more wrestling, more stuff to watch, more stuff to analyze in your own head, and uh, it's working out for me. Yeah, it's been wonderful, actually. You know what? It opened my eyes a lot to some of the stuff that I don't know that, you know, it's made me have to go look up, and glad I have because there's a lot of stuff out there that, you know, I wasn't aware of that, I'm glad I am now. I mean, there is just so many great things that have happened in professional wrestling over the years. And, you know, we do everything we can each and every time we put together one of these shows to try to find the topics that are going to, you know, tie together well and also get the fans talking, get people to open up to a little bit more from professional wrestling, whether it's the independence, whether it's, you know, the classics or whether it is some of the big guys or even the, you know, the, I guess the bigger independents that are running weekly programming or great programming that they're putting out on YouTube, like MLW and NWA and companies like that, that are, you know, out there and putting out great wrestling product that I think we should all stop maybe not arguing about and enjoying more of. I think it's something we all love. We all enjoy. It's okay not to like certain things, but Hey, let's have an open conversation about it. Like Papa Smokes and I do every single time here on Ring Respect Radio. Yeah, yeah, we're doing it that way. Uh, Twitter doesn't do it that way, though. I know that one from experience. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot, of, <laughs> lot, a lot of the trolls out there that like to uh, voice their opinions and stuff. But, you know what, it's okay to voice your opinions. But, you know what, have an intelligent conversation about it. Know what you're saying. And just enjoy discussing it with other people that watch the same product as you. How often is it that you can go out and say, hey, I'm talking to people that love the same shit as me. Why not like these people instead of working against them? Uh, but, you know, with that being said, Papa Smokes, I think that is going to bring us to the end of Ring Respect Radio for today. Uh, do you have any last things to say to all our listeners out there? No, just everybody stay safe, uh, stay occupied, and stay watching uh, all, all kinds of wrestling. Be a good fan and be good to your uh, other fans and other uh, performers around you. And, uh, yeah, stay safe. Definitely so. And yes, thank you once again, everybody, for tuning in to Ring Respect Radio here on the Video Bros Network. Click the subscribe button. Click the notification so you know anytime we release new material right here on the channel. Also, while you're at it, as always, go check us out. 
Prairie Pro Wrestling on YouTube. You can check that out where myself and Papa Smoke are the video bros and the commentary team as well. So if you enjoy our work here, you're probably going to enjoy our work over there and you'll get a little bit more familiar with some of the things we talk about right here on the show. Thank you once again, everybody, for taking the time to tune in. Stay safe out there and keep showing love and respect to one another. And we'll see you next time.